Consider for a moment that federal law enforcement tells us that they believe that the man responsible for ISIS's media campaign attended the Islamic Society of Boston. The Islamic Society of Boston was founded by self-declared Muslim brother and Al-Qaeda financier Abdurrahman Alamodi and chief among their trustees when the mosque was founded was the jurist of the Muslim Brotherhood, Yusuf al Qaradawi. Ahmed Abu Samara, the ISIS media manager in question, uh, attended the Islamic Society of Boston. He was a close personal friend of a man named Tariq Mahana, who was himself a notable propagandist for Al-Qaeda. Both men were charged with uh, plotting to assault a New England shopping mall with automatic weapons. Abu Samra uh, escapes to Syria and Tariq Mahana goes down and is convicted. <clears throat> but ISB also produced other jihadists, most notably uh, the woman known as Lady Al-Qaeda, Afia Siddiqui, who, not surprisingly, was one of the terrorists whom ISIS sought the release of uh, when they contacted uh, the West regarding negotiations for um, journalist James Foley. So Mahena and Siddiqui and Abu Samra are not alone. There are reports as many of the hundred Americans fighting abroad, many of them with ISIS. We have sources that say there are 700 recruits from France, uh, 400 from the UK, a little more than 300 from Germany, not quite 300 from Belgium, 200 from Australia, 130 from the Netherlands, 100 from Canada, 50 from Spain, all fighting for ISIS abroad. There are some estimates that go as high as two to 3,000 Western fighters in Syria and Iraq. Couple that with a report that says that 16% of French express support for the Islamic State. And I suspect that you might be left with the idea that this narrative that we have of the lone Western jihadist uh, reading things on the internet forums, that might not be sufficient to explain the depth of our problem. And I would like to argue that the Muslim Brotherhood plays a direct role in creating the ideological undercurrents among the populations, especially in the West, through which Al-Qaeda and other jihadist organizations then swim. And I'll begin by pointing out that Yusuf al Qaradawi, the same man who was a trustee of the Islamic Society of Boston, said this regarding what the Muslim Brotherhood's mission was. And he says, I quote, the greatest responsibility of the Ikhwan, the brothers, is to train the Muslim because he is the foundation stone of revolution. He is the axis of welfare and the rectification of deeds, without which the establishment of Islamic society or the enforcement of Islamic laws or establishment of government cannot be imagined. Qardawi said this in the work Islamic Education and Hassan al banna where he discussed the methods of cadre building developed by Brotherhood founder Hassan al banna under whom Yusuf al Qaradawi studied directly. And Qaradawi goes on to say that the, and I quote, aspect of Ikhwani training which makes it eminent and unique is jihad. And further that the real implication of jihad had been dismissed from Islamic training and way of life before its conception among the Ikhwan. This is not some theoretical uh, spiritual jihad that Qaradawi is talking about either. It's the very same jihad that Qaradawi called for to be waged in Syria when he urged any Sunni Muslim who was capable of doing so to go to Syria and to fight. And it's the same jihad being waged by ISIS. Uh, Qaradawi, in fact, uh, signed a statement which noted, I quote, We rejoiced over them, meaning ISIS, 
and we welcomed their mobilization to reject oppression and tyranny in the earth. However, they quickly demonstrated their split from the majority. And when he says split from the majority, he means the majority they split from was Al-Qaeda. The statement goes on to disagree with ISIS over some technical aspects of Sharia law uh, regarding how a caliphate ought to be established. And in Q&A, if you'd like to go into details on that, we can. But the point is that the Muslim Brotherhood does not differ with Al-Qaeda or ISIS over jihad as such, but it sees its role as inculcating cadres of Muslims uh, trained in this ideology. And this is made clear in the 1982 document uh, that researchers call the project and is also known as the Global Project for Palestine, which was instrumental in the Muslim Brotherhood's establishment of Hamas. Uh, in that document, one of the points uh, goes like this. It says, to construct a permanent force of the Islamic Dawah and support movements engaged in jihad across the Muslim world to varying degrees insofar as possible. This is one of the missions of the Muslim Brotherhood. And the principal way that the Muslim Brotherhood does this is by establishing what they call Islamic centers. And to quote from the explanatory memorandum on the general strategic goal for the group in North America, the group being the Muslim Brotherhood, it says, the center we seek is one which constitutes the axis of our movement, the perimeter of the circle of our work, our balanced center, the base of our rise, our dar al arqam to educate us, prepare us, and supply our battalions. And battalion is a key Muslim Brotherhood organizational term, and it refers to uh, organs that were originally created under Hassan al-Banna during the Brotherhood's founding, and they represented a paramilitary capability uh, out of which the Brotherhood then recruited for their terrorist arm, the special apparatus. And so these battalions, conceptually, are distinctly tied to jihad, and we know this from a letter that Albana wrote to the brothers uh, that is still used today as a brotherhood training tool, and it says, in this, Al Albana says, at the time that there will be ready, O ye Muslim brothers, 300 battalions, each one equipped spiritually with faith and belief, intellectually with science and learning, physically with training and athletics. At that time, you may ask of me to plunge with you to the turbulent oceans and rend the skies with you and conquer with you every obstinate tyrant, and God willing, I will do it. These, in other words, are the battalions that the Muslim Brotherhood hopes its centers will supply, who will uh, eventually help them conquer every obstinate tyrant, and like Karadawi rejoices, ISIS doing. Dar al arqam by the way, refers to uh, one of the homes of the original companions of Muhammad during his time in Mecca, and it was notable as a location because it provided uh, discrete access to and from uh, for the Muslims to gather without being observed by uh, the polytheists of Mecca at the time who were in power and who were harassing the Muslims. It's additionally notable because uh, it's described as being located in a very strategic location uh, one source describes it as controlling the street, uh, and that location was known as Safa Hill. Uh, some of you may recognize the term Safa from Safa Group, which was a confederation of Muslim Brotherhood businesses and nonprofits which were raided by the FBI in 2002 as part of Operation Green Quest. So you can see how these terms carry with them through the Brotherhood movement. In any case, the memorandum goes on to say this regarding Islamic centers. As much as we own and direct these centers at the continent level, we can say we are marching successfully towards the settlement of Dawa in this country. So, uh, it then becomes a worthwhile question to examine to what extent the Muslim Brotherhood controls mosques in this country, since that is, according to the memorandum, the means by which they determine their own success. Uh, when they say settlement, by the way, we have to remember that the Brotherhood Memorandum refers to settlement as a civilization jihadist process, with all that word means. In any case, in a 2011 survey of American mosques put out by the Islamic Society of North America, which is a Muslim Brotherhood front described in documents as the nucleus of the Islamic movement in America, approximately 31% of American mosques have affiliation with organizations which uh, we know have some tie to the Muslim Brotherhood. 
That's actually down from 51% in 2000. And the reason for that has to do with an explosion in the number of mosques following 9-11 uh, and the inability of ISNA and other groups to keep up. Uh, but in any case, um, you know, discussing the role of the Brotherhood in training and inculcating future jihadists in the West, um, does the nature of our examination of the conflict change when we consider that they control between 50 and a third, you know, between half and a third of mosques in the United States? So besides training and indoctrination, how else does the Muslim Brotherhood support movements engaged in jihad, which is their instruction according to the 1982 project? Well, for starters, they engage in influence operation and political pressure tactics, some of which Waleed described earlier. And we, we know that this is their instruction from the project Point of Departure number 5, where it says, study the center of powers locally and worldwide and the possibility of placing them under influence. Conduct a modern study of the concept of Dawah and Islamic law, and more particularly on the men of influence in the state and in the country. So that's their, that's their objective. And many of you are probably familiar with the 2011 purge of the counter... Or with the mic. Do I need the mic? Okay. Trying to avoid that pop. But. So in 2011, we have the purge of the counter-terrorism trainers that Wally referenced. Um, but for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it went something like this. Uh, someone inside uh, the administration... Uh, some people suspect now ex-DHS senior fellow Mohammed el -Biari, but in any case, someone leaks training materials to Spencer Ackerman of Wired Magazine, uh, who writes up a shrill report about how Islamophobic the FBI training is. A group of community organization, many, uh, organizations, many of whom have ties to the Muslim Brotherhood, then write a letter citing Ackerman's report to John Brennan, uh, counterterrorism czar at the White House, demanding a review of all materials, which the White House proceeds to undertake. And we now have a situation where an unnamed, unvetted board uh, excises uh, from training materials anything having to do with jihad or the Muslim Brotherhood or Islam uh, from the training of the FBI and the DOD and the DHS and so on. They're actually in the process uh, of attempting this yet again, by the way, uh, utilizing a new story which was leaked to Glenn Greenwald of uh, Snowden fame. And in this story, it talks about um, surveillance conducted uh, legally with FISA warrants uh, on a number of prominent Muslim leaders. And of the lists of those names, uh, four of them have known ties to the Muslim Brotherhood, and the fourth is a suspected Iranian agent. So this same cohort of community organizations then fires off a letter to Lisa Monaco, who has Brennan's old job. And in this letter, they demand a complete purge of the remaining materials, including uh, intelligence materials that may have been developed out of information from various briefings. And they also call for a mandatory re-education of any federal, state, or local law enforcement officer who has ever received the training in question. And they demand the, and, uh, the cutting off of federal funds for any uh, state or local law enforcement organization which uh, undertakes training of which they do not approve. <clears throat> so how is this possible? Well, it's possible because of the long list of Muslim Brotherhood groups which have ingratiated themselves with law enforcement intelligence and military officials as community outreach partners, as cultural advisors, as sensitivity instructors. Uh, the previously mentioned Ala Moody, who uh, was a frequent advisor to President Clinton. He was also responsible for training chaplains for prisons and for the military. You have Sammy Al Aaron, a politi political lobbyist who worked to encourage the uh, George W. Bush administration to terminate the use of intelligence evidence for uh, deportation hearings. Uh, during which time he was himself arrested for uh, organizing for Palestinian Islamic Jihad. You have Louis Safi, an individual with MB ties whose career as a DOD cultural expert finally ends when he leaves for Syria to become the political attaché for the Muslim Brotherhood in order to try and dominate the Syrian opposition. 
but not by the way before he sent down to Fort Hood to give a cultural sensitivity training to the soldiers there after the Nadal Hassan attack. This is placing the centers of power under influence. And we don't have to suggest that this may be what they want to do because we have documents where they say this is what you are instructed to do. So through targeting the training, the Brotherhood has hindered the ability of our intelligence and law enforcement officers to understand the information that they gather through their programs. And while he talked on the strategic level what the result of that is. But now they are targeting the ability of law enforcement to see and hear what's going on. And they're targeting legitimate legal surveillance with this Glenn Greenwald, Glenn Greenwald article. And they're also targeting the use of police and FBI informants. And they've done this through what they call the Safe Spaces Initiative, um, which is led by the Muslim Public Affairs Council, which is itself an outgrowth of the Islamic Center of Southern California, which was founded by two Egyptian brothers who have Muslim Brotherhood ties. And this effort would seek a ban on law enforcement in mosques and the uh, infiltration of informants into mosques that may be radical, while at the same time granting mosques the ability to regulate their own extremists by providing a safe place for them to have a conversation about extremist ideas. This campaign was uh, given a new force. All right, thanks. So this campaign was given new force, by the way, by HBO, which launched a documentary called The Newberg Sting about one of these informant campaigns. And on the same day that HBO launches the documentary, Human Rights Watch releases a report where they say that the use of police informants is a human rights violation. Oh, gosh. So this is the Muslim Brotherhood in America. And we've talked, as I said, about how they about how they uh, prevent counterterrorism training and how they themselves inculcate and train for the ideology of jihad. So 13 years after 9-11 is a long time to wait to finally begin addressing the roots of this conflict and to begin recognizing the role of the Brotherhood as a wellspring and facilitator of jihad. But it, it, it's fortunate to be able to say that we are starting to do that now. Uh, some of you may have seen former Vice President Dick Cheney's uh, discussion at the American Enterprise Institute where he called for the um, listing of the Muslim Brotherhood as a terrorist organization. So these, these are the kinds of conversations that we need to start having. And we're having them late. And as Waleed said, uh, when you're late, the cost is higher. But we're starting to have these conversations. and. Hopefully we can move forward with that. And with that. I don't expect that it, uh, I don't expect that it will be. I don't expect that it's intended to be. Um, I think that they, they intend to, uh, you know, support the same moderates that they wanted to support in 2011. So I don't think that there's any intention to reverse um, track. I think you know, this is, they're going to try to salvage what they can. Sure. Well, so the Countering Violent Extremism Initiative is essentially what DHS replaced counterterrorism with. And it was essentially um, a campaign modeled on, uh, like, gang initiatives. And the idea was you could do community outreach to try to limit extremism, whatever that happens to be, uh, without actually talking about you know specific ideologies that may be extreme or not extreme or whatever that means. Uh, but you know, as a matter of course, the in, the individuals on the advisory council discussing uh, establishing this you know outreach program for community organizations were members of community organizations, many of whom had ties to the Muslim Brotherhood. So you have, on one side, people with disturbing connections to the Brotherhood suggesting that your counterterrorism strategy should be to reach out to community organizations. And I'm sure they have a few that they would, would suggest to you, mainly their own.
Sure. Well, I mean, you can just look at the case in, was, I think it was Philly, where the SJP student uh, knocked out a, a Jewish student on campus. And we have a, other sim, you know, similar cases where we, we've moved not just from anti-Israel activism, but to you know, anti-Semitic behavior, and even now violence. And part of the problem that I have is that people think that these things happen by accident. No, they don't happen by accident. The report that some of you maybe picked up outside is a report that Center for Security Policy did on uh, Yusuf al Qaradawi and his International Union of Muslim Scholars. And we, we tracked the call by Qaradawi for a global intifada. He called for a global intifada on behalf of Gaza. We then follow the terminology he used and the language he used through, through um, clerics and Islamic organizations in Europe and in the United States, uh, many of those organizations tied to the Muslim Brotherhood. And they echo the similar language and the same calls uh, when, he, when Karadawi calls for a day of action on July 18th, there is action on July 18th. Uh, that, is the, that is the nature of the ideological control uh, of a man like Karadawi. And so, uh, if there are any left, I'd encourage you to, to grab it and take a look at that report. And remember that these things don't happen by accident. You know, organization, uh, protests are planned. Organizations bus people in from around the country. Uh, slogans are written. Um, and so it's no surprise that you hear the same calls. Uh, you know, Kaibar, Kaibar, O oh Jews, the army of Muhammad returns in Berlin and France and the UK and Miami and New York and Washington DC. It's not a surprise that you see Hamas flags, Hamas headbands, uh, the flags of Al Qaeda, the flags of ISIS in these protests. There's no surprise there. It's no surprise that after the protests end, you have you know, real legitimate violence in New York. There was a couple that was attacked. There's the, general, you know, the gentleman on the comp on the college campus in Philly, in Turkey, uh, a very prominent Jewish couple that had lived in Turkey for generations was murdered. This is what it means to conduct an intifada. And we all know, we, you know, I'm sure the audience here knows that better than anyone. And that's what they called for, so that's what they got. I, I, would hesitate to tell you this mosque is, this mosque is not, this mosque is, this mosque is not, except in cases where, you know, we have a pretty strong reason to believe that. In the Washington area, you're going to be looking at a mosque like Dar al-Hijra, which uh, is their own bylaws said that, uh, you know, the board is made up of the presidents of organizations that we know have ties to the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, that, that their imam there was you know, Anwar al-Awlaki before he went off to, to Yemen. Um, they, they, they themselves have produced a number of people that have been convicted on terrorism charges. They actually just very recently uh, held a protest on behalf of the anniversary of the ousting of the Muslim Brotherhood for power, where they flew large banners with the Rabia hand um, right down in a park in Washington, D.C. So in cases like that, uh, you might be a little bit more comfortable to make a determination, but in general, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't want to speculate. Sarah, of course, gets prerogative, because <laughs> she um, used to pay my bills. Right. Kyle, of the um, remaining number of mosques in the United States, do you know how many of these have um, direct connections to the Islamic Republic of Iran? No. Um, the the study, which was done, as I said, by ISNA, uh, was principally about, uh, it was ISNA's own concern that they were not uh, controlling as many mosques as they ought to be, and that kind of thing. Um, they're very open, they're actually very open about this discussion about uh, the role of the American mosque and the need to integrate the mosque and the need for a more, this is a very common term, more prophetic mosque, uh, by which they mean a mosque like the Dar al Qarm. Uh, the original sort of mosque of Muhammad, um, by which they mean an Islamic center of the Brotherhood. Um, but so, yeah, I mean, yeah, the Shiite mosques—you certainly have—you you certainly can have a question there. I know there are, there are some 
that have been suspected of that. I do, I, you know, I'm not really a, an Iranian expert, so I would hesitate to speculate.